Okay. So, uh, just very quickly, so all of you know how paging is enabled, hmm? right? And then what are the precautions to be taken before enabling paging? I thought in the class, uh, the page that enables paging should be identically mapped. Then only the next instruction will be executed. Okay. So there is a page A thousand to A F F F. Okay. Three Fs. And then there are starting from B thousand. There are there's B F F F. C thousand to C F F F. So these three are pages in the. So this is let me call it as code page one. This is code page. Two, this is data page one. Data page two. Then there is something from D thousand to D F F F. Then E thousand, ah. E thousand to some E F F F. Then F thousand to F F F F. So where are the page tables you have stated? Page table is from F thousand to F F F F. And E thousand T F F F is the page directory. And this is the what you call as something like a control page, which has all your uh, segmentation and other things. So this page should be identically mapped. This page also, this page also, this page also, this one and this one. All are identically mapped. Okay. Then every other page, the odd page should be mapped down to this one, B thousand to C thousand, and uh, B F F F, and even page should be mapped down to C F. That's how you set up your page directory and one page table. So okay, let us say this is one general thing that you can. Do. Then things like you can access a very big address, but see that it is going to access only at somewhere in B thousand or C thousand. Then jump to a very large offset, but it will jump to the next instruction. Things like that you can try, and once you do this, you will also see some changes in the page table, right? That that page is accessed, that page became dirty, all these things you can do. Right? The next uh, interesting thing is you actually make one page not available, and try to access that address. See that it goes to a page fault handler, and what will the page fault handler do? It will go and fetch the page, do a lot of things that we will not do. That the operating system will teach you. The page fault handler can just go and make that bit one and restart that instruction, so that again you can restart and start executing that again. Okay, so so you can create a page fault and make that page one and then come back. So these are all simple exercises that can, that you can basically carry out and uh, get an idea of how this paging works, right? Very very simple exercises. If you apply your mind half an hour, you can finish this. Not a great deal at all, right? And um, the interesting thing is, after that, there are a set of problems that we have been cooking, right? So every every semester we have been getting some new set of problems. So those problems, what he says, you can do this. Once you have this infrastructure, solving these problems are going to be very straight straightforward. Correct? Correct? Right? So this is what is needed out of you. So very very simple. You get these basic building blocks, get an understanding of it, then whatever. Uh, Problem is uploaded in the Moodle. Just go ahead and do that, and that is going to be very straightforward. See, I'm telling you, while doing this, you will understand the entire thing about paging. Tomorrow, in the operating system course, they talk about anything about paging. You will understand what it is. How will the page fault handler work? How will this exception be generated? All these things will be known. So you have to write a page fault handler. What will the page fault handler do? It should find out where, which page there is a fault, and then it has to go and make that one. Right? So when the when a page fault happens, there are some control registers actually updated saying where that page fault, which page, you can get some ideas. Okay, just go and look at this Intel manual three. You will get all these ideas. Right. So you have to find out where it went wrong and go and make that bit one, and then restart. Then it will work. Okay. So in in terms of this, please look uh, look at see in a page directory entry right. The first bit is a valid bit. If you have one, that means all these things make sense. If you have zero, nothing makes sense. So this is a page directory entry, and this is a page table entry. So you could have also four MB pages in large databases. They will, now we are talking of four KB. We can have the page size to be 
4 MB also. So, so we will not bother about 4 MB here, we will just do 4 KB because let us try and understand. So, the these two whatever page this is 114 page number of this volume 3 essentially talks about uh, how the page directory entry looks like and this also tells you how the page table entry looks like. Right. So, this is what is pointed to by sorry CR3. Okay, this is what is pointed to by CR3, the start of this page directory and this will point through this. Uh, so, every page table, its address will be there in the PDE entry. When the first bit is 1, as you see here, I am just rotating here. Okay, when, the mm, when the first bit is 1, then it essentially means that this entry is valid, otherwise it is invalid. And what are these things? Let us go one by one, very quickly, read slash write. What is R slash W? Where is it? Ah. Read write means the first bit is zeroth bit, which is called bit zero is the present bit. The first bit is read write. If zero means writes are not allowed, one means write will be. Anyway, a page can be read for sure, but I may not allow you to write. So, for example, where do you want, uh, in the absence of segmentation, suppose I have an architecture where there is no segmentation, uh, where, do you, where do I want no writes? Code segment, correct? Code segment I do not want to touch or I could have some parameter segments which I want to preserve, I do not want the program to come and corrupt it. So, if I make certain segments as read only, then lot of uh, security issues can be handled. The second bit is user slash, if 0 means user mode access or not allowed, okay. otherwise uh, it will be allowed. User mode means uh, uh, 3, supervisor means 0, 1 and 2, right? or 0 is supervisor, 1, 2 and 3 are user, I do not know, you just check section 4.6, hmm? we will go there, uh, but no, we'll, it will take time to come back, okay. <laughs> okay, section 4.6 will tell you. I think user is uh, 1, 2, 3, uh, sorry, user is 3 and uh, supervisor is 0, 1, 2, okay. And okay, l this l page level cache level, level right through, I will just check later, I will just tell you later. Just forget about 3 and 4, uh, we will deal it uh, when we do the cache. Fifth is accessed. After I loaded, did I go and read or write into it? That is this. Sixth is the, our famous dirty bit, okay. Now, then there is something called 7, 7 is page size, okay. page size must be 1, otherwise this entry references a page table, okay. forget this also, just make it 1, I okay. will we'll discuss about that later. 8 is global, if CR4.pg is 1, determines whether the translation is global, otherwise ignore, this also you ignore as because we are not going for 4 MB pages sir, no, okay. And there are some 9, 10, 11, 3 bits which you should, which is ignored, which you can use. Then uh, there is page address translation, again you can forget this. Uh, bit uh, M minus 20, 30, 32 of physical address of 4 megabyte, so I will forget that, okay. So these are the bits you should know uh, for sure, okay in this page directory entry and page table entry, okay. Fine? Right. So, okay. So, you set up this uh, page table and start working on it. Uh, this is easy. Uh, this, is, this is what you should see. Table 4.5 is what you should see for 32 bit, whatever you are using. That was, I think that was for a 64 bit, right? That is a 4 megabyte page, so we are doing 4 kilobyte page, sorry. So, this is what you should do, okay? And this is for a 32 bit uh, entry, okay? So, there are a lot more of this paging uh, things, but then that will come under advanced computer architecture because we need to know a lot more about a operating system to appreciate things. So, we will stop at this stage 
to give you a loop into operating system. Once you start studying operating system, there you may need so many other things. You come back to Arcade uh, and learn a lot of things. There's no point in learning so much of Intel also. Okay, Intel is not our cousin or something. Okay, so you learn something about uh, thing to just understand what is how is how paging works. The foundation will get, but we'll not focus too much on Intel. There, there are other processors. Uh, right, as I told you, right, 99% of the computing device in this earth now uses ARM. Okay, so Intel is only 1%. Because all all computing devices are mobile devices today. Right, so. So we'll not basically break our head so much, but nevertheless we should understand how it works, and this is a very nice case study. But nevertheless, if you really want to bring a secure system, I still believe why I'm you know why I'm still teaching this because down the line, if I really want to build up a hardware security, okay, then uh, it's very very important that we. I think Intel will succeed. That. This this level of double security. Three tier security. Right, you have a security at uh, segmentation, security at paging, and then four levels there. And then I have LDT, GDT type of security. Then from that, then paging. Okay. So see, dead codes. What are dead codes? Dead codes are those which you cannot actually. When you execute the program, right? You can never in get that part of the code to execute. These are all potential, you know, worms or whatever mal malicious code because in some specific input pattern that fellow will start uh, executing right so 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 that that's why so so we really don't know by just looking at a program or by even executing a program we can't do a security analysis of that because there could be some hidden part of the code and some combinations of the hidden part of the code some composition like function 1 then calls function 2 then function 3 then the behavior will be different they call function 1, then function 3, and then function 2, the behavior will be different. Okay. So I could compose it in different way and get different behaviors. So these are some very interesting things that could happen. So, so security wise, um, I think this level of 3 level of protection will be extremely okay. And then there's, I don't know what you will be learning in operating systems, but one of the important uh, concepts that we need to learn is about capability based operating system. What is a capability based operating system? A capability based operating system is one where for every every object in your operating system you have certain access rights and for every object its relation with every other object is very well defined. Okay. For example, process is an object. Now, I take one process, say some daemon, right, HTTP daemon. Right? You know what an HTTP daemon does, right? It basically runs the HTTP server, right? So if I take the mail daemon or something, so HTTP daemon has some access. So there are several resources. I have CPU, I have memory, I have uh, peripherals, I have ports, I have Ethernet cards. There are several things there. So for and then within part of your system itself, there are some specific parts of your code like file system management, process management, etc. So, so this process, what is its relation with every other process? I need to have that well defined. It should be very well defined. If it is not well defined, then that's where the lapses start. Right? So this fellow is not supposed to go. The HTTP domain is the daemon is not going to support go and touch some part of your super. Block. Why should it go and access your um, super block of your disk? There's something called super block. You learn in voice course. Why should I go and access? Right. Suppose I say it cannot access, and that is that rule is implemented, then your security of your operating system can be much more uh, effective. But that type of capability-based OS, we are not in a position to build. But what I believe is that if you go as rigorous as Intel's x86 plus this, we can build a really uh, you know, capability based OS, wherein we can enforce these policies and trust on the hardware god to implement it for us. Okay. So I put this policy, I put these rules, who will implement? I am very happy if the hardware does it for us, rather than the software, because hardware is immutable. I have designed the hardware, I can't go and change a transistor and do anything, software is good. So, So that is one reason why I still believe that uh, x86 will be
sort of the hardware when you want to start building those type of fancy or those type of really secure operating system. Doubts? So, yeah. So does any of the current OSS uses all these features of the interface? Linux uses x 36 Actually, one abridged version of Linux is even the 8,000 lines of code which you can see. If I ask you to see 2 million lines of Linux you know, code, you go mad. If x 36 go and look at x 36 So this is the whole thing. Given by so GitHub is there, then you can open X36 here. Oh, and see, beautifully they've done. So this is very well written index to code. So you will have first 10 pages or 12 pages. Yes. Oh, see, lot, lot of empty spaces, and here it starts. The memory layout. Can you see LGDT? Okay. See, so LGDT, A, ASM is assembly, so they are using LGDT. Same. LIDT, LTR, no task register, clear interrupt, STI, move instructions, GS register, all these things. So, so that means what? Uh, Linux uses lot of your assembly instruction. I'm just proving it. Okay. Just don't think that oh, we just did it. CCR2, CR3, everything is used. Okay. okay. So if you want to actually learn, see this is, oh, ah, see your segment descriptor, limit base base, then type and somewhere so limit 19 to 16. So this is your segment descriptor. So these are all completely used. So if you if you can actually go through this, uh, now it will all go to this is your this is your pro context of your process task state. Okay, so see you have you have entries for all your registers right E A X E C X E D X E B X, and then your C S S S D S. Ah, I told you right C R three. There's an entry for C R three also in your task state. Right. So for every task, okay. For every task, you can have your page directory base. I told you in the morning, right? So this is so this is a context of your process. Right, and it goes on. So. So, so the entire uh, entire course. Uh, this is this is the first line of code. Boot asm dot s. Okay. So, the first two will be some some entry here. So it goes. Okay. So this is how you 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 enable paging here. See, move l cr zero ex. R L move as E A X to C R zero. Right? So this is the point where you are uh, enabling paging, turn on paging. So whatever you did now, the operating system also does. Okay. So I'm just giving you a one to one mapping of what is happening. Okay. Then it jumps to AX and to so what you did exactly in your lab, right, for enabling paging, that is there in line number 1153 to 1154. If you understand x 6 then you can go and directly play with the kernel. Right? There are some 10 exercises here. You understand all the 10 exercises, you can go and play directly with the kernel. See, the class, lab, lab 1 to lab 7. After this, right, after your current course on the operating system course, the best thing is to take S36, understand it completely and take this, compile this into assembly and boot your, now you are booting with that USB, right? Now boot with X36 and see how it is working. And then go and change some scheduling algorithm and see how the counter works. So this, that will be the real judge. That means one full semester you should do only operating system. You can't have compiler, networking, all these things. 
but then if you do that you will become real os dada okay that is that is something because you really got a machine to boot from scratch and come up so go and read this x this is real operating system okay. Okay. so yes you are you are only using trap gate right so far Yes. You should have used only trap gate. You have used task gate because the template had it. Why? What do you mean by implement the trap gate? Just you have to go and make that IDT entry as whatever. Uh, the, 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 you have to just change the bit type that. That's all. Then it becomes a trap gate. It didn't work. Huh? Send the code. <laughs> Send the code that doesn't work. See, task gate will be taught in assignment number 5. Trap gate, and I will also explain why task gate is necessary in the context of an interrupt service routine. That I will explain. There is something called double fault. Okay. And for that, we need to have a task gate. But, but for all practical purpose for your interrupt service routine that you have written as a part of your third assignment, third, huh? third assignment. Task gate is, uh, uh, trap gate is enough. Trap or interrupt gates are enough. Task gate you should not use. Meaning you can use, but that's. Huh? We use interrupt gate to uh, make our code, but uh, if you want to do interrupt in a VLC, you have to use the interrupt gate. But if you do it in VLC code, then it's not working. Uh, because your uh, interrupt gate, uh, the privilege level of your interrupt service routine. We set it to 3. Huh? We set it to 3. So all this. You set it to 3 and what was the code segment uh, privilege level? So the interrupt, interrupt descriptor table was pointing to a code segment, right? Yes, sir. What was the privilege level of the code segment? Zero. Ah, so how will it work? So it will not work. So, right? We will, we will teach you about task gate in the fifth assignment. Right. So a trap trap gate or an interrupt gate should have worked in your uh, second, third assignment. If it didn't work, then send us the code. I will clarify it. Yeah. Mm. But the uh, precision level of the entry of the IED, mm. so it is used such that the code segment that is trying to access it have the privilege uh, uh, level less than that of the entry of the IDT, right? Right. So there are several issues here. Um, I can only talk about, I will give you a brief of what is happening. See, see, if I am a privilege K code, then my stack has to be privilege K. Stack cannot be K plus 1 or K minus 1. So this is very important. This is what XH6 will ask for. So if I am a privilege K code, my stack also will be privilege K. Okay. So if I am a privilege 3 code, the stack I am going to use should also be privilege 3. Okay. It cannot be privilege 2 or 1. If I am a privilege 2 code, the stack should also be privilege 2. It cannot be 3 it cannot be 1 or 0. Please note that. It is unlike a privilege level 3 code can access a code segment of privilege level 3 and privilege 2 can access 2 and 3. But for stack, if I am executing a privilege 3 code, it, the stack should also be privilege 3. Right? It cannot be privilege 4 or the, the descriptor should have privilege 3. So this is how XH6 is defined. The reason is as follows. Okay. Now let us say I am executing uh, a privilege level 3 code. There is one instruction which generates an interrupt or trap. Okay. Okay. Now what will happen is this will go to the interrupt. So let me say it is giving you interrupt 13. 
So, I go to the IDT table, I go to the 13th entry and here I have a code seg segment selector and then there is some privilege level here. This privilege level should be at least 3, then only this fellow, if it is PL3, this should also be 3. If it is PL2, then this should be 2 or 3. Okay. Then only this interrupt itself will be executed. Now, this will point to a code segment. If this code segment is at privilege 0, okay, this code segment, this is a selector, right? This will say some 15 or something. So, 15 10 3 in your, uh, not in your IDT, this will be a 15 10 3 in your GDT, GDT or LDT, depending on that. There you will go, here there will be a base limit, etc. And then there will be a privilege level. This privilege level is 0. That means now when a 3 code is ex executing, because of an interrupt, I am going to execute a privilege level 0 code. Right? So, what you will do is you will have a stack defined for every process that I am creating, I will have 3 stacks or 4 stacks. Every process I am creating, I could have 4 stacks. One stack is at privilege 3, another at that privilege 2, another at that privilege 1, another will be privilege 0. If this interrupt service routine is at uh, privilege uh, 1 or 0, right, then this stack, either the 0 stack or the 1 stack will be executed, depending on what the privilege level here is. So, for all the processing of your interrupt service routine, this PL3 stack will not be used, your PL1 or PL0 stack will be used, depending on what the privilege level. So, why is this done? Because I do not want the system stack and the user stack to be the same. I am a program, I am asking for a service from the operating system that is called a system call, right? I, I say printf, scanf, I go and ask many, many things from the operating system. Right? In, in C, there is a command called system, right? Are you aware of this? System and I can put whatever I want here. So, essentially I go transfer control to a system. Malloc, for example, is a system call. Okay? F open is a system call. Free is a system call. Okay? So, so, when I call that system, the system call should not execute on the same stack as me. Then what will happen after I return, I have access to the stack, right? I as a user level process has access to the stack. So, I will start knowing more about what the, uh, what the uh, stack contains, right? So, I, I, I will start having more ideas about what the stack is trying to do. And so, I do not want the privilege level 0 code to execute on the same stack because after I come back, I will have access to all that has been done. In the imagine password, right? This will take your password, do a hash, and then compute there. So all those computations, all those residue things can be there. So that's why XI6 says that you are a user fellow, you use a stack. When you want to go to a privilege level zero, uh, when you want to execute interrupt service routine, whenever when you come up, right, when you are actually spawned as a process, when you start executing, you will have your stack. Then there will be three more stacks. Suppose I am at privilege 3, there will be three more stacks, privilege 1, 2, and 0, 1, and 2. If the interrupt service routine is going to be for 0, then it will use your PL0 stack. As a process, I have four stacks, and my PL0 stack will be used by that PL0 code. If my interrupt service routine is PL1, for example, printf, fprintf can be PL1, while malloc can be PL0. Okay, so so or some uh, exit can be PL zero, right? So I have PL one, PL zero. So depending upon what my system call is, which privilege level my system call is, that corresponding stack can be used, right? Right. So so this is how. So what would have happened when you had used an interrupt gate and your core segment was at PL zero? Your zero stack would not have been set correctly, and that is why your uh, interrupt gate or interrupt slash trap gate would not have worked correctly. You are getting this. So, when a process is spawned, 
we will when i'm doing the task switching i'll i'll cover it in great detail when a process is spawned these stacks should be set once these stacks are set when i do an interrupt then these stacks will be used now what i want you to do is you you set you see there is an interrupt generated go and see which what is the interrupt number go to the code segment go and find the privilege zero of that code segment a privilege level of that code segment if it is zero then you see whether there is a zero stack set where will that zero stack set it will be set in a task state segment uh, right so we, we we will come to it first to find out what is the uh, privilege level of the interrupt service routine and then you send me the code we will we will debug and send you back are you able to follow okay